indescribable feeling we get when the Liz a Day theme song begins to play and we go somewhere we've never been before. Not just entertained, but somehow reborn. <laughs> Dazzling images on a small Twitch stream, stream, sound that is sound, somehow, Amaland horse erotica feels good in a podcast like this. Bunny Williams feels like the stoned parts of us, and May Lynn feels perfect and powerful because here they are. The Pope on Film podcast. We make movies better. on film i am bunny williams and with me is uh, my name is reverend may lynn i am the founder of the church of ed wood which is an actual thing worth a google it is episode 479 of the podcast and i would just like to take this time to say i don't know where these rumors get started about some sort of crazy new haircut that i got so uh i i just want to put that to rest as you can plainly tell clearly tell i have the exact same hair that i have always had and i certainly didn't get uh 40 percent of my head shaved as a lot of trans people and spider gwen do i didn't you know go to my wife and say hey get the razor I want a spider Gwen. It, th that's not something that I would do. It's totally, as you can see, my normal hair. Anywho, it's episode 479 of the podcast. How you doing, Bunny? You doing good? I am doing good. I am doing good. Good. Have you died yet? Uh, not yet. Good. Good, good, good. As far as I am aware of. And I just want to come out and say this. I had never... Mama, stop barking at me. I'm doing the podcast, dog. Stop. I just want to take... Stop it, Mama. Stop. You're not getting a spinoff. We already tried one of those. So... So I had not seen the preview for Not of This Earth before now when I was watching the beginning. Just because an alien comes to Earth and kills people and steals their blood, that doesn't make them a fucking vampire. What the hell? No. I'm so confused. Just because... Just because creepy Mr. Johnson is taking people's blood. That doesn't that don't make him a vampire. I'm so weirded out by that. I'm so weirded out by this. Anyway, uh, welcome to summer. And also, welcome to our seventh and final themed summer. It's 2024. The very cheap summer of Roger Corman. Yes. Or RC Cola, as I have gotten to calling him. What do you think we should call it when 
you know, because when we did the summer of Fred Willard, we had a like the Fred Willard meter, the Fred yeah. Willard ometer. I don't remember what we called it, but it was like a, we were always looking to see how much Fred Willard is in a movie. Maybe he has a big amount, or maybe it's that um, one where radio DJ is getting calls from aliens, at, in which point he has two scenes and that's it. So, like, what should we call our Dick Miller watch? Like, Dick Watch? Looking for Dick? Looking for Dick. I kind of like Dick Watch, because it reminds me of the crazy-ass Oklahoma weather people who are, like, uh, who go balls-ass nuts whenever the weather gets a little bit bad. But um, we'll we'll work on it. We'll workshop some different ones and figure it out. And I'm sorry for what I am about to say. It might upset some people, and I apologize. I'm assuming that this is my inner Ed Wood defender coming out. Because a lot of people still call Ed Wood the worst director of all time. A lot of people still call... Plan 9 from Outer Space, the worst movie of all time. And it's like, oh, wow, okay. You've obviously never seen Star Crash, but that's beyond the point. That's beside the point. Now that Mr. R.C. Cola, Roger Corman, has passed, everyone in the media, every single solitary person in the media has become a Corman defender. Now, first yeah. of all, Corman Defender sounds like a shitty Avengers mockbuster that Corman would make, probably for the Sci-Fi Channel. I'm sure. I'm sure Steve Gutenberg's available. I don't think his yeah. dance card is that full right now. He could be the uh, the uh, Iron Man, but it's a Roger Corman movie, so tinfoil guy. Uh, I'm sure you could get David Norton for cheap, too. Yeah, yeah. And you or know whoever oddly, that... Oddly, he's still a pepper. Huh. Oh, yeah. Man, yeah. wouldn't you like to be a pepper, too? Yeah. Um, I just recently saw on the news, uh, speaking of Dr. Pepper, that Dr. Pepper has surpassed Pepsi as the number two soda in the United States. Good and on I find Dr. that fascinating. Pepper. It was always Coke, Pepsi, Coke, Pepsi, Coke, Pepsi. Now it's Coke, Dr. Pepper, Pepsi. And I find that fascinating. It's probably because throughout the Midwest, everyone just drinks Dr. Pepper like water. It, it's just a fact. More people drink Dr. Pepper than water Yeah. in the Midwest, in the Bible Belt. But um, number one, Corman Defender on the Sci-Fi Channel this fall. Number two, yeah, sure, okay. Roger Corman wrote and directed and produced hundreds of films. Hundreds upon hundreds, nearly thousands of films Roger Corman had a hand in. Okay, I get that. His over is huge. But here's the thing. How many of them were good? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he made like I, I would, I would, I would say he's probably got like ten good ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd Depending say so. Depending on how we're going to define good. Yeah, that number good could point. go up to twenty, possibly fifty, but ten good ones. I was pretty bored with our second film, Rock All Night, but I think it would make a wonderful play. Yeah. I think it'd be a good, because most of it just happens in one club. Or, you know? Or whatever. I, I, we'll, we'll get there. I enjoyed okay, yeah, it. No, we'll I just don't get it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I got you there. And, uh, yeah, sure, okay. The one thing that everyone has to bring up when discussing Roger Corman, okay, he gave his, he gave 
You know, Francis Ford Coppola, Martin Scorsese, Jimmy Cameron, all of these famous people, their first big break. But you notice how none of them, after they got their first big break, went back and made more movies for RC Cola? Yeah. I yeah. think that says a lot. Yeah, he was, he was good at spotting and exploiting talent. Yes, very much so. No, on, um, I, on, on a lot of levels, Roger Corman is a genius. Or we would not be speaking about him. Or yeah. there would not be hundreds and hundreds of fucking movies with his name on it. You mm-hmm. know, to be able to last in an industry in which you suck for so long is a bit of genius in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. But also, yeah, okay, sure, you gave Martin Scorsese his first big break, but I don't know who directed Attack of the 50-Foot Cheerleader from 2012. I'm assuming it's not Martin Scorsese. Yeah. I mean, maybe it is. I didn't look it up. So maybe it is, and, and, and I'm just the clueless one. But isn't it, but isn't it the same thing, okay? If you grind through several hundred movies, 500 movies, 600 movies, how how, how many movies did he fucking do? You're going to get a few good ones. If you grind through that many directors, you're going to get some good, a few good directors. If you grind through that many actors, you're going to get a few good actors. I feel that a large portion of society's love of Roger Corman is due to the volume of films that he had a hand in and not necessarily in any way the actual quality of the films that he had a hand in. Yeah. And I just find it fascinating that like, oh, Roger Corman, the king of the independent film genre who gave their first you gave francis ford coppola his first big break but yeah yeah i'm pretty sure francis ford coppola didn't direct carnosaur three primal species are but you maybe sure, i'm wrong are, are you sure should we look it up i think maybe we should yeah, Attack of the Giant Leeches and Death Race 4 Beyond the Anarchy didn't really sweep the Oscars. No. You know? But here is a fun fact, Bunny. Francis Ford Coppola did secretly direct Shark to Puss 3, Shark to Puss vs. Whale Wolf. Now, wow. I mentioned a couple of films here Attack of the 50 Foot Cheerleader, Carnosaur 3, Death Race 4, Attack of the Giant Leeches. Shark to Puss versus Whale Wolf. Did I make any of those titles up? I don't think so. But the fact that that's even a question says something about Roger Corman's uh, movie quality. Yes. I think we can say. The fact that you may not be sure, I feel like, just proves this point. But once R.C. Cola died, all the media outlets started tripping over themselves to heap praise on the king of schlock. Here are some quotes and where they are from. The legendary Hollywood mentor, Roger Corman, that's Fox News. His contributions to the world of cinema are unparalleled. Okay, why don't you get a pillow to, or a trapper keeper to cover your... Your erection there, slash yeah. film. One of the most influential directors of all time, the Hollywood Reporter. Okay, uh, tone it down a few notches. Influ- there. Okay, no, 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 no. I call total bullshit on that. Influential. Fucking, if you are influential, then other people are trying to copy your work. Who is trying to copy Little Shop of Horrors? Yeah. Who is out there stealing laser blasts? 
Yeah, who in their right mind is copying or him? Star Lost, whatever the fuck that one is. Starcraft. I do like Laser Blast. That's the one where the aliens speak an alien language, but it's actually just presidential speeches that they play backwards. Yeah. I like that one. I like Laser Blast. That's the kid with, like, that rocket shooting thing on his arm. I like that yeah. movie. That movie's fucking horrible, and I love it. Uh, one of the most influential directors ever. Yeah, no, Hollywood that's reporter. a lie. That's a dirty lie from the pit of hell. All right, how about what this? Did he this from... What movie do you watch by any other director and be like, oh, this movie is a pe- obviously influenced by Roger Corman. Where the fuck do you say that? What did he influence? I have no idea. I have no idea. Yeah, but everyone's just heaping praise on this man, and it's like, I feel that Roger Corman is just Ed Wood with better breaks. He, and no, a he lot had, he had longer a of a career. Sense, no, he had a great sense of, of keeping his pulse on the culture and knowing what was hot yes. in the culture and rolling schlock schlit out as fast as he could to appease yeah. that. That was sheer genius yeah, of so Roger this... Corman to be like, wow, we need to come yeah, out so... with a bunch of LSD movies right now. <laughs> so that's why I was originally going to to do a, a creature feature, double feature. But I want to try and get all of his different types of movies. So it's like, okay, yeah. not of this earth, like a sci-fi sort of film. And then we need a rock and roll film. Yeah. So I randomly picked Rock All Night only because the platters were on there. And they are a legendary ass band. I'm kind yeah. of shocked that they were in a Roger Corman film. But um, oh, one more quote. This is from the USA Today. This one like legitimately upsets me. One of the most important figures in the entirety of film history. Like, he's not fucking Kurosawa. Like, give me that. Yeah, give me that again. Hit me with that one again. One of the most important figures in the entirety of film history. What the fuck? Oh yeah, you are all up in the in that scrotum with that one. Like fuck USA Today. I need you to slow it down a little bit. Jesus Christ. That's no, like no. saying Okay. That's like saying uh, America's greatest basketball player, Dan Marley. America's greatest baseball player ever, Raleigh Fingers. Like yeah. okay. Own it down a little bit. I I am okay. Envision a world. Okay? Kind of like that movie yesterday. Envision a world in which Roger Corman did not exist. I don't really think we're missing all that fucking much, okay? I don't think, like, it's the Jarvac heart, you know? I I, I don't think it's some... It, he didn't land on the fucking moon. I think if Roger if Roger Corman didn't become a success, the only thing that would be different is that uh, Jack Nicholson would have been arrested, like, nine times by now. Yeah. Beyond that, I can't really think of anything that anything that would be different. This podcast will, for its final season, because we're ending in October, we won't be heaping praise on Roger Corman here. We will be getting Shakespearean on his ass. Okay. Because, As in, friends, Romans, trans people, lend me your internet browsers. I come to Barry Corman. Not to praise him. See? I'm classing up the place now. Yeah. Now, some people I, out I, there... I will give him praise where praise is due. But don't give me the horse shit. Yeah, I'll give Roger Corman praise when praise is due. Hey, uh, Chopping Mall is great. You can't tell at all that the entire movie was shot at three in the morning. Yeah. Totally can't tell at all. It's fine. 
Now, some people out there, some film lovers, may be upset at this film podcast of ostensibly shitting on uh, our man, R.C. Cola, all summer. And to those people, I would like to say the following. Tough titties! Oh, what are you going to do? Cancel our podcast? We already did. <laughs> Sending in October. Yeah. We're burning all the bridges. Yeah. Check and mate. Booby toots. In fact, all of the people who wrote these articles sucking on a dead corpse's butt, they should all be forced to watch Star Crash in its entirety twice. And then without the internet's help, oh, and, and they can't have any phones, any laptops, any distraction. They are sitting down in a movie theater, forced to watch Star Crash twice in a row. And then after that, Without the internet's help at all, they should each write a four-page paper explaining the plot and lore of fucking Star Crash. <laughs> I mean, I doubt Mr. Lobo himself could fucking do that. Yes. In fact, I would round up all of the, the, the journalists myself and do this. Uh, you get that, uh, you get that clockwork orange eye opening shit. Yeah. And just force them to focus on Star Crash. But I think even watching Star Crash once is cruel and unusual punishment, you know? I fucking hate this movie so much. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Uh, it... Carolyn Monroe does her Exactly. Best. Anytime anyone praises Star Crash, they're, what they're really doing is praising the woman in the skimpy outfit. Goddamn right. Roger Corman, he knows what sells. I kind of um, like the robot. I'm pretty sure, though, that Star Crash goes against them in the Geneva Convention. In fact, Possibly. move over waterboarding. We're just going to show him Star Crash in Guantanamo Bay. You know? Until they ever release the day the clown cried. And we're getting close, dude. We're yeah. getting close. You know what I think they should do? They should release the script for the day the clown cried, and then we just Star Wars uncut it. Mm. We each get 20 seconds to make it. Yeah. To make one scene. Yes. I, I'm all right with that. We all make the day the clown cry. Okay. Um, so you're in Guantanamo Bay, and here are all these terrorists. I say terrorists, but they're just brown people. All of these brown people in Guantanamo Bay, and instead of getting waterboarded, okay, instead of getting waterboarded, we're trying something different, and then they put on, you know, space hassle, huh? Yes. With, like, the most makeup I have ever seen on a man. Yes. He looks like a freaking... He might as well be a K-pop singer. Uh, after just he, one he could, full... he could, he could, He could develop it into a good Bette Midler if he wanted to. He could. He yeah. could. He could. David Hasselhoff in Star Crash is more drag queen than some of the drag queens I know. But after one viewing... All of the brown people in Guantanamo Bay will be begging to go back to the waterboarding. That's how bad this movie is. Now, I didn't plan on spending so much of this episode shitting on a movie that we haven't done yet. That I feel that eventually we'll probably have to do this summer. Yeah. And I'm not looking forward to that. There are some movies I'm looking forward to. Can't wait for Fantastic Four. No. Can't wait for Chopping Mall. Then there are ones that I am avoiding. I do not want to do Creature from the Haunted Sea. And I'm not looking forward to Star Crash, but um, I didn't expect to... Pl I didn't plan on spending the majority of this opening. The Betty White Memorial Podcast segment brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends Download Today, a.k.a. Jeff, our opening. I didn't expect to spend so much time shitting on what did I write down? 
the nigh unwatchable 1978 Star Wars from Timu monstrosity known as Star Crash. But here we are. In my mind, Star Crash came about when science bred the funniest joke from Monty Python that kills you. Yeah. With the videotape from the ring. Ah. And they science breeded those two things, and then the results <coughs> were a Star Wars ripoff. <coughs> Just mentioning Star Crash anywhere on the planet Earth magically gives Mr. Lobo of Sim Cinema Insomnia a raging hard on. Yeah. So uh if Mr. Lobo's watching. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, fun fact, I smoked weed with that man. Yes. I smoked weed with Mr. Lobo, Mr. Lobo's first wife, and we were smoking in his massive backyard shed, which he turned into a uh, makeshift uh, real DIY filming studio. And so we were smoking weed in the Cinema Insomnia Studios. And so it was really weird to be like, get a get a, a pipe passed and then to like smoke up and then to look up and there's Mr. Lobo and right behind him on a table is Miss Mittens the houseplant. Yes. So I didn't just smoke weed with my wife and Mr. Lobo. And the first Mrs. Mr. Lobo. I also smoked with Miss Mitten the houseplant. And I think that that is a pretty impressive feat. Yes, it is. During his very early days in Sacramento, I knew Mr. Lobo personally back then. I had cookouts with him. I borrowed DVDs from him, and I'm pretty sure gave them back. Hell, I saw him, get this, in shorts. Uh oh. I used to work at the bookstore for a small period in time when Miss with Mr. Lobo's wife, Mrs. Mr. Lobo. I actually got him a job there. Um then Mr. Lobo left her for the Queen of Trash from a local movie festival in downtown Sacramento. And I guess to Mr. Lobo, uh my wife and I were just friends of his ex because he started ghosting me back then. And FYI. I am talking about Mr. Lobo's personal life for two reasons. Number one, I know or knew Mr. Lobo so well to know that he fucking hates talking about his personal life in public. Okay. And so I, I, it puts a smile on my face to give people a uh, sneak peek at the early days of the show Cinema Insomnia. I know he would hate it. And number two... This podcast is going to be way more open and honest between now and October when we end the episode. Okay. We're burning all the bridges, Bunny. Okay. We're burning all the bridges. In fact, uh, it, it it's like our episode, it's like our podcast now has senioritis. Ten, Ten minutes. Minute I beat you. Just, just by this much. In fact, I would say more inflammatory things, but I don't want to get in trouble. I have Friars. Richard Friars. Yes. So, um... So anyway, how you doing, Bonnie? You doing good? You doing all right? Good. Yeah. Good. Keep it good. on. Uh, good. The world is a living hellhole. Uh, other than yes, that. It is. You know. It absolutely is. I had a bunch of shows this weekend. I was going to perform in Lawton's like three day pride fest and then I was gonna perform at a drag show but um those all had to be canceled because I Lawton's really far. I had originally agreed to a bunch of different shows and performances last year back when my friend Becca uh married to a woman Becca not BFF Becca, not girlfriend Becca. So, uh, because she lived 
nearby and she was going to give me rides. Wait, 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 I was fine until you started to try to explain it. Now There's two Beccas. Fuck. So Becca married a woman named Becca? No, Becca married a woman, and then the other Becca I know married a guy. Okay. But they're both non-binary. Uh, and uh, Pan, I believe. So, so, uh, but now Becca isn't really going to any of the Pride events, so I don't have a ride. So I had to cancel all of my performances this weekend. And let me tell you, Bunny, I've primarily just been hanging around, annoying my wife, and getting high. It's been pretty fucking wonderful. Good. Next Good. weekend, I have two oh, oh, performances. Oh, oh, you have had your run-in with your haters. I've yes, that. yes, you've, you've yes. A there's a lot of that going on. How are you doing? Um, I have bipolar disorder and I am manic depressive and um, I'm just finally getting out of a huge depressive episode and starting to feel more manic. So I'm pretty excited about that. OK, good. you know, because yeah. that means no more depression. And so, yeah, I've just been high most of the time it's been pretty great it's been pretty wonderful my next performance i have two shows this upcoming saturday which I'm not even sure how that's going to go but and uh, i will be doing my first official drag number yeah at one of them and i'm very excited about that I'm doing a song from the boston band jim's big ego Okay. And I'll be performing it at a nightclub on 39th Street in Oklahoma City. I'm very excited. I saw the movie The Fall Guys. Okay. In theaters with Ryan Reynolds and whoever that British chick is who's married to Jim from The Office. Um, I really liked it. I really liked it. Really? I never saw a single episode of the TV show when I was a kid, but I never missed the opening credits. Yeah. Because there's explosions, and he's hanging from the helicopter, and there's stunts being thrown through glass, and that shitty-ass country theme song that they have. Yeah. I'm the unknown stuff, man, and uh country song off of my sister whatever um and i was like i don't know the show so i can't be disappointed if they're not faithful to the tv show because the only thing that i know about the tv show is it had a country music theme song and it had uh what's his name lee majors was that yeah it? he was yeah. the fall guy yeah okay well once the end credits start playing they play a modern Blake Shelton cover of the cheesy ass shitty country theme song. And that made me happy. Like, oh, there's the shitty country theme song. And then there's a mid credit sequence that features Lee fucking Marvin. Lee Marvin? That made me happy. That made me real happy. Lee Marvin is in the Fall Guy. Lee Marvin or Lee Majors? Lee. Uh, Whichever one was on the TV show. <laughs> Whichever one starred on the TV show. Lee Majors. He's in it. it was a Lee. It was a Lee. Might have been General <laughs> Lee. Might have been the car from Dukes of Hazard. For well, all if I it know. was just Lee, that would mean it was Liberace, and now we had got a whole other movie. Got that right. I thought of you during the Fall Guy because um, Winston Duke, the dad from Us, and the leader of the mountain tribe from Black Panther. He's in it as another stuntman. And whenever he talks to, uh, what's his name? Ryan Reynolds. No, not, it's not Ryan Reynolds. It's Ryan uh, Gosling. Ken. Ryan Gosling. I, it was a Ryan. So it, when they talk, Ryan Gosling and uh, the dad from us, they speak in movie quotes. Yeah. And so the big dude says a movie quote, and then Ryan Gosling has to guess it. And he doesn't want to do stunts anymore because he was injured. And Winston Duke just leans up to him and says, hey, it's not how many times you, you get hit. It's not about how many times you fall. And I'm like, 
is this a fucking Rocky quote? Yeah. And he says, it's about how many times you get back up. And Ryan Gosling goes, don't you quote Rocky at me? And, and it, it brought a real smile to my face. Yeah. And I'm like, yay, we did that last summer. Woo. So anyway, uh, that's all I've got for the Betty White Memorial podcast segment brought to you by Red Shadow Legends. Download today, a.k.a. Jeff, which is probably right up here. Yeah. Right up there. As you do. Oh, look at it. Do you see it? Yep. There it goes. It's raining Betty's. It's raining white. Hallelujah. It's raining white. White dead women. So we are going to take a short break. Uh, we're going to be playing some videos and some fun stuff yes. for you. Uh, you might see me with a mustache, it, but it's not me. It's a totally different person. I don't even know that person. And when we come back, we are going to be talking about our two movies, both from 1957, Not of This Earth, and Rock All Night. And let me tell you, uh, dig this, daddy -o. These movies swing. <laughs> yes. Dig this. Dig this, turkey. We're going to head in our jalopies and hot rod it over to the malt shop. Yes. But before we do that, maybe we should take a break. Should we take a break? We should take a break. I concur. We will be right back with more of the Pope on Film. Ooh, I just glitched. Can you still hear me, Bunny? I can still hear you. You killed your camera. Okay, bro. that's... Okay. Uh, camera? Hello? Okay. We will be right back <laughs> with more of the Pope on film after this. Do-do-do-do-do. That's the outro music. Do-do-do-do-do. And I'm going to try and fix this camera. You can probably cut it. All right. Break. Okay. Hey there, my little leg rolls. It's me, Dabney, the fucking alien. A lot of you have been asking to hear more about Theta Prime B. Theta Prime B is more advanced than Earth by 20 years. It'll give you a glimpse into your future. We have more disease and ecological catastrophes than you can imagine in your darkest dystopian nightmares. We have winds so strong that it picks up livestock. You never know when it's going to start raining cows. Large chunks of land have been swallowed up by the ocean, and there have been frequent Kevin Costner sightings. We have 48 variants of COVID-19, 27 variants of Ebola, and a collection of diseases released by the melting ice caps, collectively known as climate fever. We found that if you make a solution of silly putty, vodka, and snot, and inject that directly into your cock, it'll stop most diseases from entering your body. Trust me. I'm an alien. For now, enjoy these videos from Undead Cow Studios and the Pope on Film. And I think Ted Cruz is a great guy. I think Social Security should be uh, privatized. You can't go to a supermarket without being accosted by a homeless guy. Democrats and liberals attack viciously. Everybody, it's me, Reverend Stephen. Today, we're going to be doing a little taste test. I live in Oklahoma, more specifically Oklahoma, which is where the first ever Sonic drive-in restaurant was uh, started. This this town is the birthplace of Sonic. There's one, two, three, four. 
within driving distance. So they just recently announced, I say recently, a couple of months ago, they announced that they were working on a hard seltzer because everything has to have a hard seltzer now. Everything. They're going to make the blood of Christ hard seltzer. Everything has to be a hard seltzer. And I've been looking and looking and looking for it because I, I feel that Sonic food is okay. It's fine. Cat? No! Fuck off! Stop getting on my goddamn computer. Sonic food is fine. It's okay. It's all right. But what keeps bringing me back to Sonic is two things. Cherry Limeade and Ocean Water. So today I found Sonic Ocean Water Hard Seltzer. And uh, I, I have... It's 5% alcohol for volume, 100 calories, and... One gig of sugar. <laughs> One gig of sugar. They they also sell it in a variety pack. It kind of smells like ocean water. They also sell it in a variety pack, and what I've heard is that two of the variety pack are great, and the others are shit. And so you're stuck with a bunch of uh, drinks that you won't ever want to drink. So I figured... Since o Ocean Water and Cherry Limeade are the absolute best drinks at Sonic, that it's a 50-50 chance that I'll like this. Anyway, let's give it a try. Down the hatch. You're just doing a little dance on the side? Oh, for the dog. Okay, yeah, you gotta do a dance for the dog. There's no good way to say this. This tastes like a water park. This tastes like sunscreen. This tastes like the water park inside of the California State Fairgrounds. The lazy river and the wave pool. And oh no, I've gotten a little bit of the water of the wave pool in my mouth. That's what this tastes like. But I don't know, it does taste like ocean water. It, I mean, whether or not I like the taste. Cat, I swear to fucking God. It does taste a lot like a water park. Uh, but, I don't know. I think this is alright. Not a thumbs up. You get a thumb... A diagonal thumb. One diagonal thumb. It's not a thumbs up, and it's not a thumbs down. But it's not even a thumb sideways. It's, it's, it's like a... It's one of these thumbs. I wouldn't go out and buy another 12-pack, but if my choices were a Budweiser and this, I'm getting this. So, there you go. Sonic Hard Seltzer. These are hard to find. I've been looking for them for the longest freaking time, and I finally found one. So if you can, if you can find one, just get it. Just to try it. This is all right. I'd rather have this than a freaking LaCroix, I can tell you that. Rather have this than a, than a, what is that thing that all the freaking white people are drinking? White Claw. White Claw! I'd rather have this than a White Claw. This has more taste to it. Wow. I look good right now. Hey. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, so that's my taste test. Sonic, hard seltzer, ocean water. It's alright. It's alright. Thanks for watching. Be sure and like and subscribe. See you later. On the death of John McCain, Lindsey Graham was forced to roam the halls of Congress in search of another set of balls to lick. Luckily, Trump's nutsack was within sniffing distance. No matter how many times Trump hurled insults at Lindsey Graham's best dead friend, Lindsey sucked up that scrotum like Thursday soup. Oh, you're the best golfer I've ever seen, Mr. Trump. Ooh, you bring a kind of magic to the Republican Party, Mr. Trump. Lindsey Graham. What a fucking beta cup. Check out this video by our friend Tim Paul Ruff. 
in the village of Santo Palo, there is celebration. We bake mighty fine pastries this week. Yes, indeed, many fine cakes and cookies. It will bring lots of money to the village. In fact, I have announcement to make. We have finally made enough money that we can buy a real whisk oh. and give Mama Rosa a rest. Oh, thank you, thank you. Now I can die I'm happy. <laughs> Let the celebrations continue. Not so fast. Who are you? I am Sean Connery. I have come for your gold. Any objections? No! 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 No objections? Senor, we are a poor village of bakers. And one prostitute. But we have no gold, uh, just the ingredients to make our pastries. You are a village of bakers? Then I will take your ingredients. Ocho Cinco will stop you. I am afraid of no man whose name has four syllables. I will take your supplies. But first, those pancakes you made this morning weren't fluffy enough, woman. take these ingredients from these people I do then I shall stop you Do you think he's dead? I don't know, is he breathing? Let's take his wallet. <gasps> Who did this to me? It was that gringo, Sir Ocho. You shot me? I came here to defend this village against evil and you shot me? This will not go unpunished. I am Ocho Cinco and I... You shot me again. Who do you think you are? Don't you know guns are... Please stop shooting me. It's okay. I'm out of bullets anyway. Good. Now we will fight like men. No. I'm not used to hitting men. I will take my leave of you and your crappy village. But mark my words, Ocho. I'll be back. I won. Ocho, you have saved us! Oh, you have made our village safe again! Thank you, Ocho! I will always protect this village against the gringos and the vampire wizards. There are lots of things a woman does not need, but every woman needs a man! I'll go find you one. 
the village is safe thanks to Ocho Sinkhole. Until next week. What the fuck is this? Hi! 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 in horror to satisfy a desperate need never before known, a need that was not of this earth. From outer space he came to destroy the people of this planet, leaving in his path of doom a trail of terror. <laughs> Storytime with Mei Lin, a one-of-a-kind, hyperactive and interactive blend 
of adult stand-up comedy and children's story time because you're never too old for a good story. Mei Lin is going on tour in 2024 and after much deliberation, they have chosen the following wildly original name for their tour, Storytime with Mei Lin on tour, a one former man show. Brought to you in part by Spite. Don't miss your chance to see her on tour before Republicans ban her, just like they're busy banning all history books and, for that matter, books books. For more information on Mei Lin, like, I don't know, try Google maybe, or Bing if you're a weirdo. Hey, is Ask Jeeves still a thing? Probably not. Oh well. Storytime with Mei Lin. And we're back with more of the Pope on film. Funny, I don't know if I have ever said this out loud on the podcast, but I love Ocho Cinco. Yeah? I fucking love it. Good. So much, and he's got the El Santo mask on. I just, I, I really love it. Cool, I really I do. I do. That's off that to is Tim Caldwell, time. huh? I think that is the first time. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. Hats off to uh, to fucking Tim Caldwell because I love that. I love that. I love Tim, the fact that Tim he's protecting rules. a little village, and it's just like their backyard or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, the vampire wizards. Love it. I think it's super funny and cute. Um, It's time, buddy! It's time! It's time! Ugh, yes, bunny, my friend, it is time once again for all of us here on the Pope on Film podcast to shake, rattle, and or roll our way into the second half of our big shoe. And it is said second half wherein we finally it eventually get around to discussing our all new low fat zero calorie and now in limited edition jar jar binks packaging movie of the week and this week we continue Ooh. our very cheap summer of roger corman movies with yet another very cheap double feature not of this earth and rock all night. Yes. Dude, I'm, I'm dancing. Oh, man, this groovy beat really swings. You dig, daddy? Now, before we mention anything about these movies, I'm going to stop your discussion right here, Bunny. Before we jump headfirst into these two, I guess we can call them movies, I would like if I may, to shine a big old spotlight on uh, one performer in these films who deserves to get way more recognition, way more recognit, actress, and famous Hollywood landmark, Beverly Garland. Yes. The big deal <coughs> that she is the uh, star of not of this earth. And number and one. Any Corman film. And yes, uh, number one, she's freaking beautiful. Um, she's the female lead in our first movie, Not of This Earth. And for no reason other than I was bored and probably high, I looked her up. And boy, howdy, this woman's story is so freaking awesome. So, Beverly Garland. She's an actress who, according to IMDb, I believe it's pronounced, I'm the, I'm Dave's <coughs> boobs. I am Dave's boobs. That's what that stands for. I made Dave's butt. That's what it. IMDb. I made Dave's butt. Um, Beverly Garland got her start quote 
acting in a small theater in Glendale, Arizona, unquote. And I'm pretty sure I know that theater. There's only one small theater that does community theater in the entirety of Glendale, Arizona. I'm pretty sure it's still there. I must have seen like 20 different ones of those there. But I, I have been there. So in the 50s, sometime I believe after this movie, Beverly Garland starred to, in her own TV show uh, it, like a cop procedural. Really? Half hour show. Yeah, and this, I haven't even gotten to the crazy part yet. That makes her the first ever female cop on television and the first female to star in her own show on TV. That's a oh, big ass I deal. Don't know about that. That's what that's what I am Dave I made Dave's butt set. So that show was on before I Love Lucy. Hold on. Beverly Garland, Beverly Garland biography. Um The Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters inducted her into its Hall of Fame. Mrs. Garland has two very significant... Oh, no. It, it was the same year as this? Okay. Um, Miss Garland has two very significant historical television firsts. She was television's first policewoman as the star of 1957's Decoy. Oh, okay. And more importantly... The show gave her the honor of becoming the first actress to star in a television dramatic series. Okay. All right. There you go. Yeah. So um so that's pretty cool, but that's not even it cool as this next factoid. Okay. So she got her first big break. Um she had a supporting part in DOA, and then it, it. The crazy thing is, is that she had a long run on the show My Three Sons, and on the TV show The Guardian, and on she had a reoccurring spot in Seventh Heaven, and she had a long run on Scarecrow and Mrs. King. Really? Yeah. So okay. Her first husband was the actor Richard Garland, and they got married, and eventually they got divorced, and she went on to marry another person, a land developer, uh, entrepreneur, businessman, whose name, get this, this, this seems like a bad guy who's trying to shut down the rec center in a movie, yeah. but Beverly Garland's second husband was Fillmore Crank. Oh, I can see his mustache a twirl it. You know? Yeah. Man, that's such a great name. Fillmore Crank. But thankfully, Beverly Garland kept the name Garland. She didn't want to change her name to Beverly Crank. We, we would have to cast that with Kelsey Grammer. Totally. Yeah. Beverly Crank is, I'm pretty sure, is a porn actress or could be. Yeah, a porn actress. But uh, her second husband, Fillmore Craig, that sounds so fake. Um, he was working on a big high class hotel in L.A. And he he wanted it to be the nicest and the classiest and the prettiest hotel, legend has it. And so he named the hotel after the most beautiful thing he knew. So he opened two high-class five-star hotels called the Beverly Garland Hotel. Okay. And they opened up, and they stayed open up. Um, A big-time luxury hotel. There were two of them. And then when the hubby died, she ran the hotel herself and her family and in the if you're ever in the east coast you can still spend the night there 
But nowadays, it's known simply as, slight pause for dramatic effect, the Garland Hotel. Okay. But it's still there. It's it's a piece of history. That's I find that fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, Beverly Garland had a hotel named after. Oh, yeah, what was it called? The Beverly Garland Hotel. Oh, wow, going the direct route, are we? <laughs> All right, then. So the first film is not of this earth. And I said this in the beginning of the podcast. I will say it again. The bad guy in this is not a vampire. And that pisses me off. He, he's so bad. He's not. Not only is he not a vampire, he 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 sucks with worldwide domination. You yes. know he's got a he's got a few issues going on here. I think personally. Can you hit us with the plot of this, Bunny? Yeah, not really. Uh, yeah, and even worse so for the next movie. Uh, oh yeah. Well, there's an alien. Uh, he is. In this small town, uh, trying to take it over because that is his plan for world domination. Uh, his planet is out of blood, which brings up a whole yes. other problem going on here. Uh, and and some clever town townspeople thwart him. That's about it. Bunny, you missed the most important part, which is that Devana must endure! Yes. That is, of course, the most important part of the movie. This is a 1957 indie sci-fi flick uh, directed and produced by our man R.C. Cola. Hey, Bunny, how about uh, after this episode... uh, you and I hot foot it in your hot rod and we'll swing up to Lover's Lake. <laughs> How about it, daddy uh, How about we ball it up in Albuquerque like yeah. Ed Wood said in Plan 9 from Outer Space? Um, I'm, I'm just going to say it. Uh, society went downhill. When we got rid of all of our makeout points in Love Bruce Lakes. Yes. Gonna come out and say it. That's not really a thing anymore. And uh, also, boom! My dick radar has been activated. <laughs> I also kind of like dick watch activate. 22 minutes in, our man. The king of the character actors, yep. Mr. Dick M- Miller, the legend himself, appears as a vacuum cleaner salesman. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Bunny. We got us some dick here. Yeah, we definitely do. We got us a decent-sized dick, but I wasn't expecting the amount of dick we got in the second movie. I wasn't prepared for that. That's a lot of dick we got there in yeah. the second half. It's a good dick double feature. But, and you know, you know, that was definitely Walter Paisley. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, now the, Dick Miller's character in the second film, Rock All Night, that is absolutely not no. Walter Paisley. That was an actual badass guy who could look people in the eye. Um, Dick Miller. I love this man so much. He is amazing. In it, I looked up the Wikipedia, the Wikipedia for this film, not of this earth. And it, in the plot synopsis, it labeled Dick Miller as a sleazy door to door salesman. I don't know where you're getting sleazy. Yeah. You're just trying to sell, what, vacuum cleaners. Uh-huh. There's nothing slimy about them. Every salesperson is slimy. Yeah, it Not comes with deal. the business. Yeah. 
that upset me. So then he dies, and I was a bit upset about that. The thing that I find interesting is that this quote-unquote vampire that's not a vampire, it's an alien. He kills people by taking off his sunglasses and giving him a Scott Summers. But without the laser beam, as far as I can tell, that's what he's doing. Like, he has eye power? Yeah. The fuck does that mean? How? Why? I'm so confused. So the 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 planet... The planet irradiated itself so now, like, they don't have blood. Okay. So what What the fuck is he going to do? Beam it back a pint at a time? Because that's Um, what the plan here was. UPS. It's the fastest ship in the shipping business. Well, no, I I, I think the, the the big box with the human head on top worked pretty efficiently for beaming it back to his planet. You know, but still, the whole planet has to fight over to that one pint until you can get another one? Oh, okay, Bunny, it's killing me that I... the population of this planet? How far are it, we subdividing this one pint? It kills me that I don't remember the name of this, but what was the thing that they used to talk with in this island Earth? Oh, the, uh... It's on the, the tip of my tongue. The in- Yeah, dude's got an interocitor. Yeah. Period. He's got an interocitor, which can also beam people, I guess. Which is a big black empty space with a guy's head at the top. Yeah, basically. Call me crazy, Bunny. I know you'll probably not agree with this, but um, I found the plot of this to be slightly convoluted. Yes. Yet Shocker, still, I, I know. enjoyed it. I enjoyed this movie. <laughs> it was it's fun. fucking ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, no, who it was... the hell is this alien after all? I mean, yeah, he's got the mind powers, but, like, he failed in his attempt to take over and conquer a neighborhood. A neighborhood, like, like, he's Voldemort level bad. Yeah, at his job. The thing that kills me is that, um, this was an alien, a monster, who killed people and stole the blood from their dead bodies. He tried to conquer Earth, and now he's dead. Let's give him a proper burial and a headstone? Yeah. Why? No one knew who he was. You did not need to bury him. No, no. And also, whatever is in that casket is is not him because the government definitely has his corpse. Yeah. I mean, because, like, he, he, you're wasting a great opportunity to find out what an alien tastes like. Ooh, space chicken. You know, I mean, it's they're chicken. aliens, it's so it's space. not its not cannibalism. Nope. We are, would be cannibalism, because cannibalism is eating humans. Very interesting. So You really so opened up this, my mind there. So we could kind of turn this around to be like, okay, so uh, you need blood, do you? All right. Come, yeah. Come get it. <laughs> so this movie was a big time early hit for Roger Corman. Technically, it ran as the second half of a double feature along with uh, R.C. Cola's film Attack of the Crab Monsters. Yeah which we won't be doing this summer specifically because the bad guys are these paper mache crabs with Marty Feldman eyes. Yeah. 
or Buscemi eyes, whichever one you'd prefer. Yeah, yeah, I think Buscemi eyes would be more acceptable now. People, yeah, people are forgetting yeah, it was Marty Feldman. <clears throat> yeah, paper mache giant crabs with Buscemi eyes. I always hated the look of the crabs from Attack of the Crab Monster. But this was a huge hit that gave them the money to keep making schlock. It was remade in 1988, starring Tracy Lords. Yeah. Then it was remade again in the 90s, but I have no information about that. I thought this movie was short and dumb and fun. Yeah. It was nice. I, I was rooting for the former criminal. Yeah. That's the guy I was rooting for. He almost made it to the end. I was like, oh my god, Dick Miller's here. Oh shit, he's gonna die. And yeah. then he just died like that. And I'm like, damn it. But I want Dick so bad. But then <laughs> we got to our second film, Rock All Night. Holy shit, there's a lot of dick in this. That was a lot of dick. And look, funny, can I say something on the podcast without you? immediately getting all judgy with me. Okay. You know, because remember that I'm a trans woman, okay? And I'm a Hispanic trans woman. I'm okay. not just a unicorn. I'm a unicorn made of snowflakes that okay. landed in downtown Phoenix in August. So just don't attack and get all judgy. I'm just going to come out and say it. This movie was made in 1957. I did the math. Dick Miller is 29 years old in this film. And I'm not saying that Dick Miller can get a piece of this. I'm saying badass 29-year-old Dick Miller can do whatever he wants with all of this. <laughs> Gesturing to all of me. Like, Walter Paisley, I don't find attractive, but holy shit. Badass, angry, going to beat up the professor from Gilligan's Island, Dick Miller, he can take me out for a nice night. Yeah. I won't say no to him. Very handsome. But hey, Hepcat, this movie really swings. It's a gasser, daddy -o. I'm hep to Dick Miller's jive slang. It's the end. They said that at some point in time in the film. It's the end. Dick Miller technically has top billing, but I think Dick Miller has top billing because people want this to be a rock and roll film and not a chick film. Yeah. Because the chick, I feel like the woman's the star of this film. Oh, and I looked her up. Um, Julie, the female lead, her biggest role was as Joey Bishop's wife in his four-season sitcom. Yeah. And then later she was in Falcon's Crest. Uh-oh. And that's a name you weren't expecting to remember today, but you're welcome. Uh, so, uh, so our boy Dick Miller has some pretty top billing in this swinging film that he does. With... The platters. Yes. The fucking platters, buddy. I the reason why I picked this is because it's like, okay, here's this lady singing, and then here's the blockbusters. Okay, and here's the platters. Hold on a second. I fucking know them. Yeah. This must have been very early in their career to for them to be. In a Roger Corman film. Okay, so I looked them up. They had an astounding 40 hits, charting hit songs between 1955 and 1967, including four number one hits. They are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, for shit's sake. And you know them. Everybody knows them. They sang, Only You. Yes. Can make your butt not itch. And they also sang Smoke Gets in Your Eyes. They sing that. And they also sing 
I only have eyes for you. They had an eyes face, <coughs> maybe. And then they sang, oh, this is the one that, of theirs that I really like. Oh, 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 yes, I'm the great pretender. Which uh, Julie sings in the movie. Yeah. And then um, uh, they, they sang, um, you loaded 15 tons. What do you get? They sang that, too. Yeah. They were a big ass deal. They were a huge band. They were a big deal in the music world. And in true Roger Corman fashion, they're in the first nine minutes and no more. Yep. If I was a hip swinging cat in the 1950s and I went to this movie to see The Platter, I'd be fucking pissed. Yeah. Like, dang. They're in the first nine minutes. They're singing nothing I've heard of. I did find the theme song but, Rock All Night by the Blockbusters on Spotify, and I've been listening to it. But see, Roger Corman knew that, but he was just like, <laughs> already got your money. Yeah. Yeah. Originally, the platters were also going to be the Blockbusters, and they were going to be throughout the film. But then uh, this whole thing came about because, like, whatever the studio is just said, hey, the platters want to be in a film. We can put them in one film. Anybody got an idea? And Roger Corman said, I've got an idea. So he got them. But then when it came time, they got this big script where the, the platters were a major part of the plot. But then uh, the platters being the platters are like, okay. You've got us for one day. And so Roger Corman's like, shit. We need to rewrite this entire script. And then that's what happened. And I think that's why in the beginning, they're in the rich ass place. And then they go to the actual movie. Yeah. Which all happens well, in a shack. You know what pisses me off? Quinn Tarantino's like, I'm using the best cameras, the most amazing cameras. For this incredible, high-definition, one-of-a-kind experience, The Hateful Eight. It is a massive epic. Yeah, right. Most of the movie's in a shack. Yeah. That pisses me off. Well, what were you going to say? So, okay. So, so it seemed to me that this was really a, a bunch of smaller stories of people we didn't care about. It and it seemed, seemed like, like it... they would go to the the cool nightclub and watch the platters. But then after their two drink minimum, they'd go up to the street to the the shitty little dive bar to get their real drink on. Yeah. Yeah, but that yeah, that's basically what the original movie was going to be about. But when they found out that they only had them for like this amount of time, yeah, Roger Corman said, "Shit, okay, then we need a second band because we will have the platters for this long." And then they filmed two songs, and then okay, well, we can't do any more. So, but you can see the movie, yeah, that the platters would have been in, and and it was pretty much. Everybody's story was pretty much being presided over by bartender Joe Flaherty. Yeah. Who was definitely going home that night with that other guy. Absolutely. No 100%. Doubt. The bartender is fucking the journalist. Yeah. Period. Ten minute warning. Ten minute warning. I beat you. Uh, so, um... Yes, uh, Dick Miller was 29 when he made this, and 29-year-old Dick Miller can get himself some of this. Um, I thought Dick Miller was great. Oh, uh, the bartender, his name was Joe Exposition. Yeah. And it's like, hey, what can I get you, journalist? How are things in the paper? Oh, look, here's that famous boxer. Yeah. And it's like, basically, that was his entire job was just explaining to everyone what was going on. 
Dick Miller was great. I liked the Hepcat lingo that was swinging. I wasn't expecting to see Barbara Morris in this. See who? She's the Bar. Her her name isn't Barbara Morris because she spells Barbara B A R B O U R A, and that pisses me the fuck off. So it's not Barbara; it's Barbara. She was the love interest from A Bucket of Blood. She was the hero in The Wasp Woman. Okay. And she was the boxer's uh, wife in this. It was nice to see her. I have had a crush on her since I first saw A Bucket of Blood. Yeah. Freaking love her. Um, I, f- I found it to be a bit confusing. Because yeah, it's like it, it's like a bunch of interconnected stories done badly. It's like Quinn Tarantino saw this and said, "What if I made this film, but better?" And then he made Pulp Fiction. Yeah, because this feels just like a pulpy, like five different random characters that have just been put together, and one of them's the fucking professor from Gilligan's Island, yes. but he's made a gun out of coconuts. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, like, there's no real plot plot, as far as I understand. And nope. everybody's smaller little subplot was just too boring or tried to remember or yeah. keep track of. Dick Miller was cool. Then the professor tried to rob the place. Yeah. Kind of what it comes down to. And that's it. But at the end, Dick Miller not only lives, but he gets the girl. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that. I don't like the fact that the professor, that his character name was Jigger with a J. Jigger. I didn't like that. Yeah. They kept saying the J word way too much and it made yeah. me uncomfortable. Because I'm an ally. But it was nice seeing the professor. I, I wasn't expecting to watch a Roger Corman teeny bopper rock and roll movie and end up seeing Dick Miller beat the shit out of a Gilligan's Island cast. Yeah. Wasn't expecting that. In my mind, the singer Lady Julie married the short guy. A lot of short shaming in this film. And they get married. They they meet. They fall in love. They get married. And now they're the old couple from Gremlins. Ah. That eventually, uh, what, Lucy, Linda, uh, Julie dyed her hair black, curled it. And now that's how they're both living in whatever Bedford Falls um, replica Gremlins was set in. But once, just once, wouldn't you like to see Gilligan get the shit beat out of him? Fuck yes. Fuck yes. Yeah. I would absolutely love that. So, okay, so that's all I've got for this week's film. I will say, I I think I said this earlier, I did find the theme song to Rock All Night by the Blockbuster on Spotify, and I've been listening to it fairly regularly. It really swings. Yeah. It's the living end, daddy-o. <laughs> okay, so that's all I've got this week. I thought that... Next week, we could do the big two of Bucket of Blood and Little Shop of Horrors. But then, no. Um, I decided to go a little bit farther. So next week, we're doing The Wasp Woman, which I believe we have done before, but I'm not entirely sure. I don't know. But our second feature next week, Really excited about this. 
The Pit and the Pendulum, our oh, first dude. color film, and our first Edgar Allan Poe, which I think everyone agrees are like the only real good movies that Roger Corman made. There are some others. Oh, or, yeah. or ones that aren't so bad. Yeah, but but the Poe ones are sort of universally beloved. Yes. And Vincent Price. Oh, wow. Classic Vincent Price. So I'm excited about that. The Wasp Woman is, of course, free everywhere, and The Pit and the Pendulum, I'm working on. Okay. Give me a few hours, and it'll all be straightened out. But that's next week. Uh, this week, though, oh, man. Uh, Dick Watch. Ocho Cinco, uh, getting high with a house plant. Star Crash, fuck that movie. Fuck that movie. I hate that fucking movie. So fucking much. Maybe that'll be the last movie we see. Oh, can you imagine a double feature? Star Crash and the Fantastic Four. Yeah. I like his Fantastic Four. Yeah. Uh not the best. I have no problem with it. But not yeah. bad. Well, no, no. I've seen the other Fantastic... It is the best. I've seen the other Fantastic Fours. Oh, well, I meant out of movies. If you're talking about out of Fantastic Four movies... Yeah. <sighs> this one doesn't have uh, Jessica uh, Alba... Uh, let me rewatch it and I'll let watching you know. Watching white, being white face. Yeah. But looking back at this episode, I gotta say, I think this has been a pretty good episode of the podcast there, buddy. This has been a damn good episode. Okay, good. I, I felt the same way, but I didn't want to sort of step on your toes because I feel that that's like a you thing. And I didn't want to. Anyway, I concur with your assessment, good sir. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am May Lynn, and on behalf of Natasha and Q and everybody else in the Pope on Film Studios here in beautiful, sunny Kent, Ohio, I just want to say thanks for listening, and we will see you next week, you godless heathens. And the kids aren't here, which is great, because I think we're going to take a nap after this. Q, do you want to cuddle with me? Oh, wow. Okay. I thought all 18 year olds like cuddling with their trans Hispanic moms. It's okay, mijo. Trying to embrace my Spanish roots by throwing in a few little bits of Spanish. Isn't that right, pinche pendejo? You probably do speak more Spanish on a daily basis than I do, but I'm working on it, okay? Cool your enchiladas, Q. Q's name in Spanish is Que? So there you go. Uh, do, 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 I'm not going to get cut off this time. Pretty excited. Do, 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 Oh, Bunny, I forgot to tell you. Did you cut already? No. Okay. I discovered the secret of the, I discovered the meaning of life. I got really high like a week and a half ago. And I started watching this like meditation video. And so that's when it hit me, the entirety of the meaning of life. It's very exciting. So I wrote it down and I've got it right here. You are going to, this is going to blow your mind. It's going to change society. Okay. So. 